Thursday. I don't know about you all, but I am tired. It's been a long week already. <laughs> We're almost almost done with the week, I guess. Hello, 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 hello. Oh, yeah, tired. It's all right. We'll make it through. We'll make it through together. We're going to read some Ovid's Metamorphoses. And then uh, tonight, I will be on Hyper for Warhammer. So I'm looking forward to that. That should be fun. Uh, it's been great the last couple of weeks, helping transition the team there as well as people who are watching into ninth edition. And uh, I, oh, I, I definitely have allergies, but I get more, instead of dry eyes, I get like drippy eyes, which is all sorts of fun. Yeah, so you might see me like dabbing at my eyes, which is which is great. Um, but yes, uh, so yeah, I'm on Warhammer over at Hyper, uh, I'm helping them transition into Ninth Edition and just do some more some more fun stuff. It's been good. Tonight, I think there's going to be an army on there that we haven't seen in a little while. That should be cool. Um, Go back to try doing some more with uh, command points and stratagems, which is good. And then maybe maybe even some of the new terrain rules. There's there's a lot of new stuff to try, so hopefully we'll we'll get to some of that. Um, what else? What else? What else? I don't know. Let's do some reading. As I was discussing on Twitter, uh, and I don't know why I didn't think of this before, but yep. It's morphin time. Probably because I'm I I never I was never a fan of Power Rangers, so that doesn't immediately spring to mind when I hear things are morphine or metamorphoses, but but it does make sense. Okay, so last time we read about the sad story of Phaethon. That was a long one. And then we got some Cadmus, we got Acteon, who was because he saw uh, Artemis bathing, or Diana rather, uh, he was turned into a deer and torn apart by his own dogs. Very sad. Very sad. So now, let's see, so next is the story of Semele. But we actually pretty much got that story on Saturday when we were doing the Bacchae. So I'm going to skip over it. Hold on one second here. Excuse me. Uh, yes, hopefully you all were there on Saturday for the Bakai. It was super fun. Uh, the Home Buddies did a great job. Uh, if not, I will... I mean, you can see all my VODs, but I'll, I'll make sure to remember to highlight it so it stays on there. And I'm in the process. I'm going to put a bunch of my past streams on YouTube, so it'll be a little bit easier for people to watch if they so desire. Yeah, Saturday was Saturday was really great. A lot of a lot of really good choices in the performances. Let's put it that way. Um, oh, so this one's really good. Another character who we've seen before in on Saturday, no less. So we have the story of Tiresias, and if you're following along, we are in book three. So, while these things were happening on Earth, and Bacchus, Semele's son, was twice delivered, safe in his cradle, Jove, they say, was happy and feeling pretty good with wine. Forgetting anxiety and care and killing time, joking with Juno. Now, a couple things to unpack real, here real quick. So remember that we're referring to Bacchus, Semele's son. Bacchus, Dionysus, same, same dude. That he was twice delivered. Does anybody remember what that means and why he is twice delivered? Well, there's the whole story of how uh, Semele got with Zeus to have Dionysus, and then uh, Hera, Juno here in Roman, came down, and it's not playing on the test, uh, Juno heard, heard some hints about what happened, so came down and was talking to Semele, uh, you know what, I should, start, I should start writing some of these names out, because Semele, uh, 
And so sort of to, to taunt her and find out what really happened, Juno was like, wait, so you so you said you were with Zeus, where, Zeus uh, you said you were with Jupiter, not not like just some mortal, you're not like trying to trying to just tell a story. And someone was like, no, 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 it was, it was really the god. And Juno said, well, you know, if you were actually with, with the god and you have, a, you know, some sort of a relationship with him, surely you could say to, to Jupiter, you know, come, come and visit me in your, your full actual form, not in disguise. And Semele says, oh, okay, sure, I'll do that. And so she beseeches the god to come to her in his full glory. And Jupiter is like, ugh. Why do people always ask for things that are not good for them? And so he does. And of course, Jupiter's full glory involves uh, a lot of flash and pizzazz and thunder and lightning. And so her little hut just just is annihilated. Like it's gone. There's nothing left. She's ash. Uh, so, but Jupiter saves the unborn Dionysus and then sows, again, in some stories at least, uh, Jupiter sows Dionysus into his own thigh to continue gestating, and then later, once he's fully mature, uh, cuts him out of his own thigh. So Dionysus, Bacchus, has two births, one from Semele and then one from Jupiter. <coughs> now you hear here that Jupiter, Jove, again, same, same, same character, different names, He's killing time and he's joking with his wife Juno. That's also not a good idea. So he's so here is here is Jupiter or Jove speaking. I maintain, he told her, you females get more pleasure out of loving than we poor males do ever. She denied it. So they decided to refer the question to wise Tiresias's judgment. He should know what love was like from either point of view. Once upon a time, he had come upon two serpents mating in the green woods and struck them from each other, and thereupon from man was turned to woman, and was a woman seven years, and saw the serpents once again, and once more struck them apart, remarking, If there is such magic in giving you blows, that man is turned to woman? It may be woman is turned to man. Worth trying. And so he was a man again. As umpire, he took the side of Jove. And Juno was a bad loser. And she said that umpires were always blind and made him so forever. No god can overrule another's action, but the Almighty Father, out of pity, in compensation, gave Tiresias power to know the future. So there was some honor along with punishment. Uh, yes, Jupiter is Zeus. So in, in Roman stories, Zeus becomes Jupiter or Jove. So Jupiter equals Jove. Yeah. Again, it's basically the same deities, just with, with different names. So yeah, so so the gods are hanging out, just just joking around, and Jove says... Uh, women enjoy sex more than men. Get more pleasure. And Juno denies it, and they go to ask the one person they know has, they, they know can answer this for them, Tiresias, who has been both man and woman, and transformed back and forth, um, and apparently had sex as both. And then he sides with Jove saying that women get more pleasure, uh, and then Juno is mad and, and makes him blind. <laughs> so there you have the story of Tiresias. All right, so now we get into another very famous one, the story of Echo and Narcissus. And so Tiresias, famous through all Aeonian towns and cities, gave irreproachable answers to all comers who sought his guidance. One of the first who tested... The truths he told was a naiad of the river Liriope, whom the river god Cephasus embraced and ravished in his watery dwelling. In time she bore a child most beautiful, even as a child, gave him the name Narcissus, and asked Tiresias if the boy would ever live to a ripe old age. Tiresias answered, yes, if he never knows himself. 
How silly those words seemed for how long, but as it happened, time proved them true. The way he died, the strangeness of his infatuation. Now, Narcissus was 16 years of age and could be taken either for boy or man, and boys and girls both sought his love. But in that slender stripling was pride so fierce, no boy, no girl could touch him. He was out hunting one day, driving deer into the nets, when a nymph named Echo saw him. A nymph whose way of talking was peculiar in that she could not start a conversation nor fail to answer other people talking. Up to this point, Echo still had a body. She was not merely voice. She liked to chatter, but had no power of speech except the power to answer in the words she last heard. Juno had done this. Typical, right? Juno is behind a lot of people's punishments and, and odd torments. So Juno had done this. When she went out looking for Jove on top of some on top of some nymph among the mountains, Echo would stall the goddess by talking until the nymphs had fled. Sooner or later, Juno discovered this and said to Echo, the tongue that made a fool of me will shortly have shorter use. The voice will be brief hereafter. Those were not idle words. Now Echo always says the last thing she hears and nothing further. She saw Narcissus roaming through the country, saw him and burned and following him in secret, burning the more she followed, as when sulfur smeared on the rim of torches catches fire when other fire comes near it. Oh, how often she wanted to come near with coaxing speeches, make soft entreaties to him. But her nature sternly forbids. The one thing not forbidden is to make answers. She is more than ready for words she can give back. By chance, Narcissus lost track of his companions, started calling, Is anybody here? And here, said Echo. He looked around in wonderment, called louder, Come to me! Come to me, came back the answer. He looked behind him and saw no one coming. Why do you run from me? And heard his question repeated in the woods. Let's get together! There was nothing Echo would ever say more gladly. Let's get together. And to help her words, out of the wood she came, with arms all ready to fling around his neck. But he retreated. Keep your hands off, he cried, and do not touch me. I would die before I gave you a chance at me. I give you a chance at me. And that was all she ever said hereafter, spurning and hiding, ashamed in the leafy forests and lonely caverns. But still her love clings to her and increases and grows on suffering. She cannot sleep. She frets and pines, becomes all gaunt and haggard. Her body dries and shrivels till voice only and bones remain. And then she is voice only, for the bones are turned to stone. She hides in woods and no one sees her now along the mountains, but all may hear her, for her voice is living. Okay, so obviously we get the story of Echo. How, why, why do we hear Echo's words that come from? Well, it was actually a... A minor, a minor goddess, a nymph, who fell in love, but then basically wasted away in her pining for Narcissus. She was not the only one on whom Narcissus had visited frustration. There were others, naiads or oreads, and young men also, till finally one rejected youth in prayer raised up his hands to heaven. May Narcissus love one day so himself, and not win over the creature whom he loves. Nemesis heard him, goddess of vengeance, and judged the plea was righteous. There was a pool, silver with shining water, to which no shepherds came, no goats, no cattle, whose glass no bird, no beast, no falling leaf had ever troubled. Grass grew all around it, green from the nearby water, and with shadow no sun burned hotly down on. Here Narcissus, worn from the heat of hunting, came to rest, finding the place delightful. Uh, and the spring refreshing for the thirsty. As he tried to quench his thirst inside him, deep within him, another thirst was growing, for he saw an image in the pool and fell in love with that unbodied hope and found a substance in what was only shadow. He looks in wonder, charmed by himself, spellbound, and no more moving than any marble statue. 
Lying prone, he sees his eyes, twin stars, and locks as comely as those of Bacchus or the god Apollo, smooth cheeks and ivory neck, and the bright, the bright beauty of countenance, and a flush of color rising in the fair whiteness. <clears throat> Everything attracts him that makes him so attractive. Foolish boy, he wants himself. The loved becomes the lover, the seeker sought, the kindler burns. How often he tries to kiss the image in the water, dips in his arms to embrace the boy he sees there, and finds the boy himself elusive always, not knowing what he sees but burning for it, the same delusion mocking his eyes and teasing. Why try to catch an always fleeing image, poor credulous youngster? What you seek is nowhere, and if you turn away, you will take with you the boy you love. The vision is only shadow, only reflection, lacking any substance. It comes with you, it stays with you, it goes away with you, if you can go away. No thought of food, no thought of rest can make him forsake the place. Stretched on the grass in shadow, he watches, all unsatisfied. That image vain and elusive, and he almost drowns in his own watching eyes. He rises just a little, enough to lift his arms in supplication to the trees around him, crying to the forest, What love, whose love has ever been more cruel? Your wood should know. You have been given many lovers, places to meet and hide in. Has there ever, through the long centuries, been anyone who has pined away as I do? He is charming. I see him, but the charm and sight escape me. I love him, and I cannot seem to find him. To make it worse, no sea, no road, no mountain, no city wall, no gate, no barrier parts us, but a thin film of water. He is eager for me to hold him. When my lips go down to kiss the pool, his rise, he reaches toward me. You would think that I could touch him. Almost nothing keeps us apart. Come out, whoever you are. Why do you tease me so? Where do you go when I am reaching for you? I am surely neither so old nor ugly as to scare you. And nymphs have been in love with me. You promise, I think, some hope with a look of more than friendship. You reach out arms when I do, and your, smi your smile follows my smiling. I have seen your tears when I was tearful. You nod and beckon when I do. Your lips, it seems, answer when I am talking, though what you say I cannot hear. I know the truth at last. He is myself. I feel it. I know my image now. I burn with love of my own self. I start the fire I suffer. What shall I do? Shall I give or take the asking? What shall I ask for? What I want is with me. My riches make me poor. If I could only escape from my own body, if I could only... How curious a prayer from any lover. Be parted from my love. And now my sorrow is taking all my strength away. I know I have not long to live. I shall die early. And death is not so terrible, since it takes my trouble from me. I am sorry, only the boy I love must die. We die together. He turned again to the image in the water, seeing it blur through tears and the vision fading, and he saw it vanish. He called after, Where are you going? Stay! Do not desert me. I love you so. I cannot touch you. Let me keep looking at you always, and in looking, nourish my wretched passion. In his grief, he tore his garment from the upper margin, beat his bare breast with hands as pale as marble, and the breast took on a glow, a rosy color, as apples are white and red sometimes, or grapes can be both green and purple. The water clears, he sees it all once more and cannot bear it. As yellow wax dissolves with warmth around it, as the white frost is gone in the morning sun sunshine, Narcissus, in the hidden fire of passion, wanes slowly with the ruddy color going the strength and hardihood and comeliness fading away and even the very body echo had loved she was sorry for him now though angry still remembering you could hear her answer alas in pity when narcissus cried out alas you could hear her own hands beating her breast when he beat his farewell dear boy beloved in vain were his last words and Echo called the same words to him. His weary head sank to the greensward, and death closed the eyes that once had marveled at their owner's beauty. And even in hell he found a pool to gaze in, watching his image in the Stygian water. While in the world above, his naiad sisters mourned him, and dryads wept for him. And Echo mourned as they did and wept with them, 
preparing the funeral pile, pile, the beer, the brandished torches. But when they sought his body, they found nothing, only a flower with a yellow center surrounded with white petals. Ooh. Yeah, so we get the story of Narcissus and Echo. They're a little bit connected. Basically, Echo wastes away because she loves Narcissus and cannot have him. Narcissus sees, she curses, or well, she curses him, but a, <coughs> yes, uh, but a another youth who fell in love with him also curses him. The god Nemesis hears goddess of vengeance and Narcissus is cursed to love only himself. Sees himself in the water, cannot take himself away, and just wastes away and dies. <laughs> so yes, and obviously that's where we get the word. A narcissist. Someone who loves himself. You may know some narcissists. You may see them on the news. Or they might be in your house, I don't know. <laughs> there are narcissists everywhere. They are interesting people to deal with. Okay, let's see what's next. I am a Coetis. So next is Pentheus and Bacchus, and I'm just looking to see if this is the same. <laughs> well, Undead Saints fan, I, I didn't wanna I didn't wanna say it, but yes, that's what I was thinking. Um, so we're gonna I'm gonna skip over this next one. It's very long and doesn't have a lot of stuff. Okay, basically it's it's the story that we that we heard in the Bacchae on Saturday. Uh, it's just another version of it of Bacchus of Agave tearing apart Pentheus. Basically, same thing. Uh, yeah, every politician ever. <laughs> that that's a good point too. Okay, so moving into book four. Ooh, okay, this is good. Okay, so there's a little intro. Um, okay, so they're talking about Bacchus or Dionysus, whatever you want to call him. He is young, this god, a boy forever, fairest in the heaven. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Wait, that's not. Yeah, okay. Uh, fairest in the heaven, virginal, when he comes before the people with the horns laid off his forehead. Even Ganges in far off India bows down before him, the slayer of the sacrilegious Pentheus, destroyer too of impious like Hergus, whose battle axe one time was raised against him. He turned the Tuscan sailors into dolphins. That's a fun story. Hopefully we'll get to that one. The lynxes draw his car with bright reins harnessed. Satyrs, bacantes, follow, and Silenus, the wobbling old drunkard, totters after either on foot with a stick to help him hobble, as shaky on three legs as two, or bouncing out of the saddle on his wretched burro. Wherever Bacchus goes, the cries of women hail him and young men's joyful shouts and drum and timbrel sound, and cymbals clash and flutes pipe shrill. So we're talking about Bacchus, and then we're going to get into a bunch of stories. Lighten our task by telling us stories. Uh, which to begin with? About Dersitus, maybe, a girl turned into a fish, all covered with scales, swimming in a pool near Babylon? Or her daughter, a pure white pigeon, who lived out her days on the high towers? And then there was the story about a naiad who, by charms and simples, turned small boys into fishes and became a fish herself or how the mulberry tree changed the fruit's color from white to the deep crimson from the stain of blood this story seemed the best one not being known too well and so she told it okay so here here is a cool story the story of pyramus and thisbe does anyone know this story no shame if you don't. Just check in. Pyramus and Thisbe. Okay, so pay attention to this story and see if it reminds you of a more famous 
more popular story you may know. <coughs> Next door to each other, in the brick-walled city built by Semiramis, lived a boy and a girl. Pyramus, a most handsome fellow, Thisbe, loveliest of all those uh, of all those eastern girls. Their nearness made them acquainted, and love grew in time, so that they would have married. But their parents forbade it. But their parents could not keep them from being in love. Their nods and gestures showed it. You know how fire suppressed burns all the fiercer. There was a chink in the wall between the houses, a flaw the careless builder had never noticed, nor anyone else. For many years detected, but the lovers found it. Love is a finder always. Used it to talk through, and the loving whispers went back and forth in safety. They would stand one on each side, listening for each other, happy if each could hear the other's breathing. And when they would scold the wall, You envious barrier, why get in our way? Would it be too much to ask you to open wide for an embrace, or even permit us room to kiss in? Still, we are grateful. We owe you something, we admit. At least you let us talk together. But their talking was futile, rather, and when evening came they would say, Good night, and give the good night kisses that never reached the other. The next morning came and the fires of night burnt out, and sunshine dried the night frost, and Pyramus and Thisbe met at the usual place, and first, in whispers, complained, and came, high time, to a decision. That night, when all was quiet, they would fool their guardians, or try to, come outdoors, run away from home, and even leave the city. And, not to miss each other as they wandered in the wide fields, where should they meet? At Ninus's tomb, they supposed was best. There was a tree there, a mulberry tree, loaded with snow-white berries near a cool spring. Now remember, every story has to have something that changes. So we heard that this is the story of how mulberries changed from white, what they were originally, to red. The plan was good. The daylight was slow in going, but at last the sun went down into the waves as always, and the night rose as always from those waters. And Thisbe opened her door, so sly, so cunning, there was no creaking of the hinge, and no one saw her go through the darkness, and she came, veiled, to the tomb of Ninus, sat there waiting under the shadow of the mulberry tree. Welcome, telephone, this is Thematic Thursday. And on our Mondays and Thursdays these days, we are reading Ovid's Metamorphoses, Roman mythology, with a bunch of cool stories. And we are reading the story of Pyramus and Thisbe. Uh, so yes, so she gets there to the tomb and is waiting under the mulberry tree. You're welcome to listen or chat or come back another day when I'm doing something that's more interesting to you specifically. It's all good. Love made her bold, but suddenly here came something. A lioness, her jaws a crimson froth with the blood of cows, fresh slain, came there for water. And far off through the moonlight, Thisbe saw her and ran, all scared, to hide herself in a cave, and dropped her veil as she ran. The lioness, having quenched her thirst, came back to the woods and saw the girl's light veil and mangled it and mouthed it with bloody jaws. Pyramus, coming there too late, saw tracks in the dust, turned pale and paler, seeing the bloody veil. One night, he cried, will kill two lovers, and one of them most surely deserved a longer life. It is my fault. I am the murderer, poor girl. I told you to come here in the night to all this terror and was not here before you to protect you. Come, tear my flesh, devour my guilty body. Come, lions, all of you, whose lairs lie hidden under this rock. I am acting like a coward, praying for death. He lifts the veil and takes it into the shadow of their tree. He kisses the veil he knows so well. His tears run down into its folds. Drink my blood too, he cries, and draws his sword and plunges it into his body. And dying, draws it out, warm from the wound. As he lays there on the ground, the spouting blood leaped high, just as a pipe sends water spurting through a small hissing opening when broken with a flaw in the lead and all the air is sprinkled. The fruit of the tree from that red spray turned crimson and the roots soaked with the blood dyed all the berries the same dark hue. 
Isby came out of hiding, still frightened, but a little fearful also to disappoint her lover. She kept looking not only with her eyes, but all her heart, eager to tell him of those terrible dangers about her own escape. She recognized the place, the shape of the tree, but there was something strange or peculiar in the berry's color. Could this be right? And then she saw a quiver of limbs on bloody ground and started backward, paler than boxwood, shivering as water stirs when a little breeze ruffles the surface. It was not long before she knew her lover and tore her hair and beat her innocent bosom with her little fists, embraced the well-loved body, filling the wounds with tears, and kissed the lips cold in his dying. Oh, my Pyramus, she wept. What evil fortune takes you from me? Pyramus, answer me. Your dearest Thisbe is calling you. Pyramus, listen, lift your head. He heard the name of Thisbe, and he lifted his eyes with the weight of death heavy upon them, and saw her face, and closed his eyes. And Thisbe saw her own veil, and saw the ivory scabbard with no sword in it, and understood. Poor boy, she said, so it was your own hand, your love, that took your life away. I too have a brave hand for this one thing. I too have love enough, and this will give me strength for the last wound. I will follow you in death, be called the cause and comrade of your dying. Death was the only one could keep you from me. Death shall not keep you from me. Wretched parents of Pyramus and Thisbe, listen to us. Listen to both our prayers. Do not begrudge us whom death has joined, lying at last together in the same tomb. And you, O tree, now shading the body of one, and very soon to shadow the bodies of two, keep in remembrance always the sign of our death, the dark and mournful color. She spoke, and fitting the sword point at her breast, fell forward on the blade, still warm and reeking with her lover's blood. Her prayers touched the gods and touched her parents, for the mulberry fruit still reddens at its ripeness, and the ashes rest in a common urn. The story ended, there was a pause, then another sister, Lucanui, broke through. Okay, and then we start the next story. Uh, but yes, Pyramus and Thisbe. <clears throat> two young lovers whose parents families hate each other rush off to a nighttime rendezvous there's a misunderstanding about possibly one has died and there is suicide a familiar story you might say you might say that they were star-crossed lovers uh yes yeah, so the more you read Stories like Ovid and some other mythology, uh, it becomes clear that Shakespeare pulled a lot of a lot of his stories from from these sources. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say Shakespeare was a hack, but you could say that. <laughs> uh, there's also definitely an element here of sort of comedic horror, right? We've got Pyramus stabbing himself, and the the blood from his wound fountains up so high that it sprays all over the tree. I mean, it definitely sounds like something out of uh, Evil Dead or Army of Darkness. Right, <laughs> and, I, and I happen to be enjoying my red, red drink today. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we have, there's so many, there's so many great ancient stories that of course it's bound to happen that people later on will, will pluck certain themes and elements and stories out of them for their own for their own uses. But yeah, that's that's a good one. Let's see. All right, what's next? The sun god on the Kothui. Let's, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead and find a really good one. Because I know there are some other really good ones in this chapter. Story of Salamarchus. Mm -hmm. This one's kind of interesting. Okay. There is nothing new under the sun, absolutely. <laughs> and Shakespeare should know since he stole some of his ideas from older stories. Uh, okay, the story of Salmachus. Here, let me write that. Like I said, I'll try to get better about actually writing out some of these names. You are going to hear the story of a fountain, Salmachus, with an evil reputation because its waters make men weak and feeble whoever goes bathing there. The cause is hidden. 
the fountain's enervating power well known. A boy, the son of Mercury and Cythera's goddess, that would be Venus, Aphrodite. Oh, have fun with your RPG session. I will see you later. <laughs> okay, bye. Uh, Cythera's goddess, yeah, that's, that's Aphrodite in Greek or Venus here. Uh, a son of Mercury and Cythera's goddess was nurtured by the naiads in their caverns. You could recognize his father and his mother both in his handsome looks, and he took his name from both of them, Hermes and Aphrodite, which, again, it's interchangeable. So Hermes and Aphrodite, hence you can see he was called Hermaphroditus. Right. So we get Hermes plus... Aphrodite, and you may be able to guess where the story is going. There you go. Fifteen years old, he left his native mountains, left Ida for the new delights, to wander in unknown lands, to look at unknown rivers, his eagerness making it very little trouble. And so he came to Lycia and Caria, and there he saw a pool, translucent even to the very bottom. No marshy reeds grew around it, no sedgy grass, no spiky rush. The water was clear as glass, and the pool's edges bordered by greenest lawn, and in the pool was dwelling a water nymph, not one who cared for hunting, bending the bow, or racing. She would never follow Diana in the hunt. Her sisters used to reprove her often for not taking quiver and spear, for mingling with her leisure the, hardish, the hardships of the chase. She would not listen, but only kept on bathing in the water, or combing her lovely hair with a comb of boxwood, or looking into the mirror of the water to find what dress was most becoming of her, put on diaphanous garments and recline to rest on the soft greenery, or gather bright-colored flowers, and she was gathering flowers on this particular day when she saw the youngster and wanted what she saw. So this person sort of reminds us of Narcissus a little bit. But still she waited, controlled her eagerness a very little, just time enough to smooth her dress, to wear her most becoming look, to be as pretty as she ever knew how. Then she called to him, Are you a god, dear boy? I could believe it. And if you are, I think you must be Cupid. If you are not a god and only mortal, how lucky your parents are, and brother and sister and wet nurse if you had one. But most lucky, luckiest of them all, your bride, if any is worthy in your sight to be so promised. If there is such a girl, then let my pleasure be a secret kept between us. If there is not, then marry me. Let us go to bed together. So she said, hey, if you're already married, we'll just keep it on the down low. But if you're not, let's go get hitched. That was all she said. But the youngster started blushing out of ignorance of love. But blushing was most becoming. Apples have such color in the sunny orchards, or ivory when tinted, or the moon eclipsed, the red below the white, when the bronze vessels of the superstitious clang loud to bring her back to life. A lot of imagery packed into there. We won't get into all that. The naiad kept pleading, begging for a kiss, at least the, one ki the kind one gives a sister. Just kiss me like your sister, sure. She was ready to throw her arms about his snowy neck. Stop it, he cried. Will you stop it? I am leaving this place and you. Salmachus, trembling, answered. I leave the place to you then, and pretended to go away, but looked back often, found bushes to hide in, and remained there watching. And the boy, as if no one were looking at him, strolled over the grass, went wading in the water, and quickly, captivated by the coolness, flung off his clothes. Desire of the naked body held her spellbound. Her eyes were bright and burning as the sun glass shines. She can hardly bear the waiting, hardly postpone her pleasure. Mad to hold him, amorous, eager. He slaps his body, plunges into the pool, goes flailing through the water. A white and gleaming figure, a lily flower, or ivy, translucent glass around him. He's having fun, he's jumping around. I win, I have him, she cried, stripped herself naked, dove, swam to him, and held him fast, resisting. 
sought his reluctant kisses, touched his body, stroked his unwilling breast, embraced and held him whatever way she could. He fought and struggled, but she wrapped herself around him as a serpent caught by an eagle borne aloft entangles coils around head and talons, or as ivy winds round great oaks, or an octopus extends it in its prey extends its prey within its tentacles. <clears throat> he refused her the joy she wanted most, but still she held him body to body. He would not escape her fight as he may. Oh, grant me this, she cried in prayer to the gods. May no day ever come to separate us. And they heard her prayer, and the two bodies seemed to merge together. One face, one form. As when a twig is grafted on parent stock, both knit, mature together. So these two joined in close embrace, no longer two beings, and yet no longer man and woman, but neither, and yet both. Hermaphroditus saw that the water had made him half a man, with limbs all softness. He held out his arms, lifted a voice whose tone was almost treble, pleading, O father and mother, grant me this. May every one hereafter who comes diving into this pool emerge half man, made weaker by the touch of this evil water. It was granted that prayer, and ever since that day the waters hold that contamination. So, clearly, we got a few things going on here. Uh, but obviously this is a justification for people who are either, and again, looking at, looking back at ancient people, it's hard to know exactly what they're talking about, but either who are intersex <clears throat> in some way, have sexual characteristics of both male and female, or some sort of transgender on, the, on, on a spectrum there. So basically, how do you have people like that? Through the, through the views of ancient science, <laughs> through the eyes of ancient culture. <clears throat> well, clearly it has something to do with the gods, and the gods were involved in creating this, this creature, this place that would, that would cause such a thing to happen. Um, and again, that's sort of... All of these myths are come down to what we could call the, the beginnings of science, right? Trying to explain things that are in the world around us. And this, obviously this is where we get the term hermaphrodite, which is not really a term that's used all that much in for humans at least. Um, sorry, children running around. Hello. Oh. Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting story. Next, we will jump to... Skip that one. Do I want to read I know? Get some underworld stuff. Want to read about the underworld? Yes. Let's read about the underworld. So overall, this is the story of Athamas and I know. <coughs> Excuse me. Athamas and I know. Okay. Now Bacchus was recognized through Thebes, a mighty godhead, and everywhere I know his mother's sister proclaimed his power. She of all the sisters escaped from suffering, except for grieving over the rest of them. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Whew. Let's have another drink. Much better. Proud of her children, her husband Athamas, and most of all, proud of the god she fostered. She offended Juno, who could not stand her. So, she thought, my rival bears a child, and he has power to transform sailors. Give the flesh of a son for his mother to tear to pieces? Turn the daughters of Minius into bats? And what can Juno do beyond weeping at insults unavenged? Is that enough? Is that my only power? But he himself has shown me what to do. To learn from enemies is right and proper. 
He has given more than ample demonstration in the history of Pentheus how far madness can go. So why should Ino not be spurred to madness down the road her sisters followed? There is a way that leads steep down, all shaded by deadly yew trees, leading through dumb silence to hell's abode. There sticks, the sullen river breathes fog, and there the new ghosts come, descending from their due funerals. Pallor and chill hold these untended areas, and the spirits, new come, are lost and do not know the road toward the Stygian city and the palace of Dis, the Dark One. But the city has a thousand wide approaches, gates that open on every side. As ocean takes the rivers streaming from all the world, so does this region receive all souls. There is always room for many, for more and more. And the growing population is hardly noticed at all. And there they wander, the bloodless, boneless, disembodied spirits, crowding the forum of the royal palace or going through the motions they made while living. Juno could face it if she must, her hatred, her anger being what they were. Descending, she crossed the threshold, and the threshold groaned beneath the substance of a heavenly body. And Cerberus reared his head in triple baying. Arr, arr, arr. She called to her the Furies, the night-born sisters, dreadful, implacable. They were sitting there before Hell's adamantine portals, combing black serpents out of their hair. They saw her coming in rows. This place is called the Place Accursed. Here Titios, stretching over nine full acres, offers his vitals to be torn and eaten. Here Tantalus forever tries and fails to drink, and the fruit he reaches for forever eludes his hand. Here Sisyphus forever rolls the great stone uphill, or else pursues it as it comes bounding down. Ixion whirls, pursued, pursuing, on the turning wheel. And Belus's daughters, the ones who killed their husbands, bail up the water in the sieves forever. <clears throat> so we get a vision of the underworld and some of the, some of the great sinners of the ancient world. Now, I hesitate to use that word, that word rather. Uh, that's what they're called. That's what they're referred to. Uh, but the idea of sin is packed with so much Christian uh, ideals and the ideas of sinning against God that it's not really the proper term to use for for this kind of a culture and this kind of a religion. But you get the idea. People who have done wrong against the gods and who are punished in the underworld forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Obviously the most famous are Tantalus and Sisyphus, but there are some other ones in there as well that have interesting punishments. And Juno glowers at them, first Ixion, then Sisyphus, and asking, why does this one, this brother only, suffer endless torment while Athamas dwells arrogant in his palace with his queen Ino, scornful of my godhead? She tells the causes of her hate, her journey, her purpose, that the house of Cadmus fall, the Furies drive Athamas mad. Her orders, promises, pleadings, all assail the sisters in one breath, and when she finished speaking, Tisiphone, the grizzled one, shook back her matted locks. There is no need, she answered, of going round and round. Whatever you order, consider done. Leave this unlovely kingdom. Go back again to the air of happier heaven. So Juno went back happy and found Iris waiting before the heavenly portals, ready to sprinkle her with purifying water. You can't just go to hell and come back to Olympus. You gotta be purified. Tisiphone snatched up a torch, all steeped in blood, put on a robe still dripping with the same crimson, wound around her waist a writhing snake, and started on her errand. Grief was her company, and dread, and terror, and madness, who could not control her features. She stood on the threshold, and the very doorposts shrank from her touch. The shine of the polished maple dulled, and the sun went swiftly into hiding. Ino was mad with terror, and her husband, in panic, tried to get her out of the palace, 
but the fury would not let them go. Her arms with serpent muscles reached at them. Her hair shook and that nest of serpents hissed. Her shoulders, her breasts, were something snakes went crawling over, their flashing tongues spitting out blood and poison. She found two in her hair and tore them loose, one for each victim. Over Aino's breast, over the breast of Athamas they glided, breathing their pestilential breath upon them. Their bodies took no hurt, their minds alone received infection, and the fury added foam from the jaws of Cerberus and poison from the Hydra's glands, and wandering illusions and mental darkness, crime and tears and madness and lust for murder, all of them compounded with the green juice of hemlock and the red of fresh arterial blood, all brewed together in a bronze cauldron. As they stood there shaking, she poured this over their shoulders, and it ran down over their chests, into their hearts. She whirled her torch in circles through the air, and kindled fire with fire moving. And her task was done, her victory assured, and she descended back to the phantom regions, put aside her dress of serpents. Uh, so we see that the, the Furies here, Tisiphone in particular, is just, she's just riddled with snakes, right? She's got snakes, she has snake muscles in her arms, she has snakes in her hair, uh, she tears two of them loose and throws them at Athamas and Aino, and literally in a cauldron has mixed up a potion of all of this horrible stuff, right? There's the poison of snakes, foam from the jaws of Cerberus, also poison from the Hydra's glands, and illusion and all this other stuff that's pumped in there, plus hemlock, which as we know is poison, uh, and blood, and it's all mixed up, and she pours it over them, and it makes them crazy. Athamas raised, raved aloud in the palace courtway, spread the nets here, comrades, these woods are full of lions. I just saw one, a female with two cubs. He dashed at Aino as if she were an animal. His son, Learchus, laughing as if the game were funny, was torn from his mother's arms. Athamas swung him around his head over and over, flung him head first at a wall of rock. And then the mother, wild from her grief or the poisonous infection, howled and went streaking off with her hair streaming, holding her child, the little Melikerta, crying, Hail Bacchus! Juno broke out laughing at Bacchus' name. Much good he will ever do you, that precious foster son. A cliff hung over the sea, whose beating waves had hollowed out the lowest part, a roof against the rainfall. But the top rose sharp and sheer above the water. Here Aino climbed, for madness gave her strength and fearlessness, and launched herself and her burden far out into the ocean, and the wave churned with white foam. But Venus, taking pity for her unmerited sorrow, spoke to Neptune. O god of the waves, whose power is second only to heaven, I ask great things. Have pity on them, these folk of mine, plunged in the vast Ionian, and add them to your gods. Something is due me. <clears throat> Some favor from the ocean depths I sprang from, a foam-born goddess. Neptune heard the prayer, took from the victims all their mortal being, gave them divinity, and changed both name and form, gave the new god a name, Pal Palemon, and called the goddess mother Leucothea. The Theban women, following after Aino as best they could, saw the last traces of her at the cliff's edge, certain that she had perished. They wept for Cadmus's house, tore hair and garments, called Juno unfair, too cruel to her rival. This Juno would not stand for, and she told them, how cruel I am, you shall be the greatest witness. No sooner said than done. I know's most faithful companion cried, I follow my queen, and would have taken the leap, but could not move a muscle, stood rooted to the rock. And then another, trying to beat her breasts, felt arms upraised, stiffen. Another, reaching over ocean, her hands became a woman of stone. Another pulled at her hair and felt her fingers harden, caught in the very gesture. So they all, or nearly all, posed in that stone, but some, once Theban women, skimmed the water 
as seabirds. So these sad women are being turned into, mostly into stone, but also, what the hell, summer birds. Why not? Uh, sometimes this, these stories are a little goofy. Like we said, sometimes the, the justification for where the uh, where the transformation comes in is just like, and something transformed right at the end, and, and there we go. Uh, but yeah, so obviously we see the Juno, not a nice lady. Is it deserved? Is she justified because her husband is constantly cheating on her? Well, that's that's an argument you could make. But Juno definitely uh, lives for the punishments that she can mete out the horrific things that she does to the people who have loved uh, Jupiter or their families or their children or anything else. All of these, all of these kind of things. Yeah. Uh, we get the end of Cadmus, who we talked about gets turned into a snake. Uh, we talked, we heard about that in the Bacchae. Let's see. So then we get the story of Perseus. Let's see, which is a lot. There's a lot going on there. We get some more stuff about the constellations. And yeah, we'll get lots of transformations. Uh, yes, Juno is, is Hera. <coughs> uh, so Perseus, let's see. Uh, Perseus bringing back the wondrous trophy of the snake-haired monster <clears throat> through thin air was cleaving his way on worrying wings. As he flew over the Libyan sands, drops from the gorgon's head fell bloody on the ground, and earth received them, turning them into vipers. For this reason, Libya today is full of deadly serpents. So again, just like all of these little tiny notes. And why is the desert of Libya filled with snakes? Well, it's because... <coughs> Perseus flying back to Greece flew over, holding Medusa's head, blood dripped out, and the blood hitting the ground turned into snakes. Sure. Why not? Um, let's see. Yeah, so he flies. He's flying over the sky. He sees all the constellations. He, like, Phaethon is afraid of them, but he makes it through. Uh, he goes to... He goes to see Atlas... Do sorry, just skipping through a little bit of the the really long stories. Okay, so actually this is kind of cool. So he talks to Atlas. Atlas, Iapetus's offspring, loomed over all men in his great bulk of body. He ruled this land and the sea, whose waters take the sun's tired horses and the weary wheels at the, longs, at the long day's end. He had a thousand herds, no neighbors, and he had a tree all shining with gold, whose golden leaves hid golden branches, whose golden branches hung with golden apples. Perseus greeted Atlas. If the glory of lofty birth has any meaning for you, I am the son of Jove. If you prefer to wonder at great deeds, you will find that mine are very wonderful. I ask for rest for friendly shelter. But Atlas, doubtful, thought of an ancient oracle of Themis. Atlas, the time will come when your tree loses its gold and the marauder is Jove's son. Mm. Fearful of this, Atlas has had walled his orchard, given its keeping to a monstrous dragon and kept all strangers off. He answered Perseus, Get out of here, you liar! Neither Jove nor glory gets you entrance here. He added a lusty shove, though Perseus resisted, argued, and tried appeasement. But at last, inferior in strength, for who could equal the strength of Atlas, he told the giant, Well, anyway, since you will give me nothing, I have something here for you. He turned his back, held up with his left hand behind his body, Medusa's terrible head, and, big as he was, Atlas was all at once a mountain. Beard and hair were forests, 
and his arms and shoulders were mountain ridges, and what had been his head was the peak of the mountain, and his bones were boulders. But still he grew, for so the gods had willed it, and his great bulk upheld the starry heaven. So Atlas, who we know as... Uh, from from Greek stories before this, but also from the Roman stories, right? He's holding up he's holding up the sky. That's his deal. He's punished for siding with the Titans against the Olympian gods. That's his punishment. Uh, we had heard that Heracles had visited there as part of his labors, took over the holding so that Atlas could fetch a couple of the apples for him. Uh, and then didn't want to take the sky back from Heracles and said, no, no, you, you hold on to it. And Heracles, Heracles, not the smartest fellow, but smarter than Atlas, and that should tell you something, devised a plot and said, oh, okay, you got me. I'll hold up the sky for, for you forever, but just take it back for a second so I could fix my lion skin into like a cushion for my shoulder. And Atlas says, okay, took it back. And Heracles says, ha ha, I'm not taking it back again. So, uh, but yes. He finally, he meets his fate when he is visited by Perseus. Uh, Atlas scorns Perseus for good reason, because he's had an, an oracle that tells him that it's not going to end well. And then Perseus is like, basically, F you, uh, takes out Medusa's head and turns Atlas to stone. Atlas becomes a giant mountain that, there, that thereupon holds up the sky on top of the mountain. Makes sense. Uh... Yeah, so we're in, let's see, so we're in the middle of book four. Got a little bit more Perseus, and then Perseus will pick up in book five. A lot of interesting Perseus stories, and again, they branch out into other transformations. We're going to get some stuff about the muses. Then the next, oh, book six, we're going to get Niobe, Terius, Procne, and Philomela. Get some birds, Jason and Medea, Scylla later, Daedalus and Icarus. Oh, so good. Theseus, Deonera, Heracles, lots of, well, Hercules here, lots of Hercules stories. Iphis and Ianthe, Orpheus and Eurydice. Oh, so many good stories in this. Pygmalion, Adonis. Atalanta, yeah. So Hercules is a bottle. Yeah, Hercules is not not the not the nicest guy. I mean, he had bad things happen to him. Another another victim of Hera and Juno. But uh, cool. Yeah, thanks, Undead Saints fan. I'm glad you're enjoying the stories. And anyone else who's out there who's listening who might be lurking, hopefully you're enjoying these. Um, we'll do we'll do a few more days of Ovid. I'll try to not have it take too long, and then. I don't know, we'll move on to something else. Uh, what else is happening? So yes, like I said, I will be on tonight. Hey, Fadir. <laughs> I'll be on tonight on Hyper with Warhammer. So that is 7 o'clock? 6 o'clock? I think it's 7 o'clock. Uh, I don't know, look out for tweets to make sure. Is it six or is it seven? I think it's seven. I don't know. I'll tweet about it. But yes, Warhammer on Hyper tonight. And then I'll be back tomorrow with Figure Friday. We'll go over some cool stuff. Um, doing something with my family right after the show tomorrow. So it'll be a hard out. And then I'll tell people about what we do after that. Tomorrow, remember, tomorrow night is the big launch of all of our Halloween and horror soaps, my wife's soap company. <clears throat> We've been previewing things all week. There's still more that are coming. There's a preview that I think is going out right now, this morning, another preview tonight, and another preview tomorrow morning. But all of the all of the stuff will be available tomorrow night. Some really cool stuff. Um and then we'll have Saturday will be Home Buddies stream. I believe we're doing, pretty sure that it's going to be Andy's stream. And he's going to be talking about fighting games and sort of the 
the history of fighting games, his his history with fighting games, and how they've influenced him, stuff that he's played over the years. It sounds fascinating. I'm I'm super interested in that. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's all I have to say today. So again, thank you for joining me. I I love reading these stories. If you ever have any questions or thoughts or anything else, by all means, let me know. Twitter is the easiest way to get a hold of me, usually. Thank you for the follow, Just Vic. Coming in right at the end. Come back tomorrow. We're going to build models and talk about toys and stuff. Otherwise, I'll see everyone later on for Warhammer. And have a great Thursday. All right, everybody. That's it for me today. Bye.